stay. <laughs> I don't want to waste everybody's time. Uh, I think they said I have 15. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna hit that. I'm really nervous in public speaking. Uh, I don't know where to begin. JBL, where should I start? Congratulations to all the other inductees and the presenters. We've seen some very talented individuals here. Uh, there are talented individuals in these seats. There are heroes of mine. There are people I have looked up to. There are people I have worked with. Um, and I'm proud to be here. And I'm proud to have shared wrestling rings and roads and cars with a lot of you that are here today. Uh, I've been a lot of things in my life. First and foremost, currently, Probably the thing that I'm most proud of is I am April's husband. None of this is about me. This is all going to be about the people that got me here to this moment. Uh, because I think professional wrestling is so interesting. I think a lot of us have quirks and we're so ego driven. And you got to believe in yourself so much to make it. You have to sacrifice, you have to survive. But the truth is, none of us really get to where we're going without a village. My wife has helped me tremendously, and she currently inspires me to be a better person, to try to understand myself and other things better, and I love her to death. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. The business is a lot different when I got in. But the basics and the fundamentals of professional wrestling are the same as they ever was. If it worked in the 1940s, it can work today. You just have to know how to apply it. And the basics and the fundamentals of professional wrestling were taught to me by Ace Steel. I started goofing off in a backyard with my friends in 1993. Right? It was just something to do. I liked comic books. I liked stuff that got beat me up, that, that got me beaten up in school. I didn't fit in anywhere. And in fact, show of hands, how many here, how many here are wrestlers? How many here have taken a bump before? Now, do you remember why you got into business in the first place? Because you loved it. You had to love it. Well, we're going to get to Harley. Don't worry, we're gonna get to hard. I got into this business because I loved it, but I also didn't fit in anywhere. I tried out for the football team my freshman year of high school. They told me I had to cut my hair. I said, well, that's not for me. I was more into being the opinionated punk rock kid with a six inch livery spike mohawk. I thought that was more important at the time. I tried out for the wrestling team. They said, congratulations, you made it. But man, you gotta, you gotta fucking cut that hair. And now I walk around and all the NFL players got Mohawks. I feel like I might have missed the boat, but I'm glad I did because I had to outsource and I found wrestling. Moving off in the backyard with my friends, I was the ambitious one. I borrowed some lumber from local, <laughs> some local businesses, let's just say, and I built myself a wrestling ring that friends would goof off in. That turned into saving money to buy a ring from somebody in Texas, and I, I, I think it wound up being an old UWF ring. And from there, I realized we, we ran our first show in 1997, and I remember watching the VHS tape that night and thinking, holy shit, we suck. <laughs> but I had gone out and got a promoter's license because the only thing I knew was punk rock. I knew do it yourself. I know if you wanted to do something, if I wanted to be in a band, Go to the pawn shop, maybe, yeah. maybe borrow an instrument, you know? <laughs> I didn't know there was wrestling schools. The internet wasn't really a huge thing yet. I met Ace Steel and a guy named Danny Dominion in the bathroom of the Rosemont Horizon at a WWF house show. They gave me a business card, and I was like, what is this, a wrestling school? Huh. Yeah, I didn't know you had to go to school. I had heat on me because I was a backyard wrestler. I showed up and they beat the crap out of me. And it's been a love affair ever since. From there, I wrestled every weekend I possibly could. Nothing mattered. Girlfriends, 
jobs, responsibilities. The only thing that I cared about was getting in a car with whoever I could and driving anywhere. And we were lucky because we were in Chicago. We were very central. I could drive to Michigan and the Upper Peninsula. I could cross over into Canada until I got thrown out the first time. <laughs> you could go to Minnesota. You could drive down to Kentucky, Indiana. 13, 14, 15 hour drives to Philadelphia. We went everywhere. Now this is back at the time when you had to write down a resume, put a couple of promos and matches on a VHS tape and send them out. And promoters would call you. <laughs> Mickey knows. And you would get and you would get booked. And I think the first match that I would say kind of put me on the map was when I got to wrestle two guys, Ray Mysterio Jr. and a man by the name of Eddie Guerrero. I wish Eddie was here. Yeah. Yes. I wish Ray was here. He appears to have left. That's fine, though. No, I understand Ray. That's flat, right? There's a lot of people I wish were here. I wish Steve Kern was here. He's not dead. He's just in Florida. That might be worse. <laughs> Sorry, Flat. I mean, like 90% of the wrestlers in the world live and are from Florida, so. I was fortunate enough to meet Eddie Guerrero, I think it was maybe 2001, and man, this guy, this guy changed my life. He, he was so kind and he was sweet, he was going through it. He had just been fired, he was going through a divorce, he was worried about seeing his kids, uh, but all he knew was wrestling. So he was on the road, he was working independent shots, he was getting booked in New Japan, and I remember meeting him for the first time and him looking at me and saying, like three ways that don't make any sense to me. If it's okay with you, you and Ray put it together and just call it to me. And I had very limited experience with going out and just kind of winging it. You know, I'm, I'm an indie kid. We would sit down and map everything out from A to B. And man, if you got concussed or the ring broke or you know a riot broke out or something, something happened, you didn't know how to zig or how to zag. You learn on you, you learn on the fly. But Eddie that night made me realize how garbage I actually was, but made me feel like, man, there's so much room for improvement. And if this guy is willing to step in the ring with me, wearing basketball shorts and Doc Martens, I need to up my game to show him respect. Because none of this is about me. I stand on the shoulders of giants. Literally, I would not be able to do any of this if it wasn't for people like Eddie Guerrero, for people like Tracy Smothers. I wish Chris Candido was here. And I am now, thank you, thank you. I am now at the age where, unfortunately, my contemporaries are passing away. Jay Briscoe, Bray Wyatt, two people who should still be with us, two people who I consider to be young. Still, Terry Funk recently just passed away. I was fortunate to know Terry Funk. Man, Terry Funk lived a life. I think if you were to ask Terry right before he went, are you ready to go? He would have told you he was ready to go 10 years ago. But Bray, Jay Briscoe, I don't think they were ready, so I think it's important to remember them. The first name I ever worked in the wrestling business was Tracy Smothers. And I was scared to death because he came up to me in the locker room and he said, Oh, hey, man, hey, look, oh, you look good. You're swimming. You eat cans of tuna, lift weights, doing Olympic lifts. Oh, man, listen, listen, man, I see those matches you have with Ace and with, with uh, Chris Hero and all that stuff you do. Oh, God, I can't do any of that. I can't remember any of that either. So if it's okay with y'all, is it okay if we just call it out there? And I acted cool, like, sure. We'll just walk and talk, baby. <laughs> I was terrified. And when I saw him in the ring, and he ran outside, he grabbed the fans' nachos and their cheese, and I knew I was wrestling in a barn in southern Indiana with a five and a half hour drive ahead of me, no shower. I was like, this son of a bitch is going to cover me in nacho cheese. <laughs> we didn't talk about this in the back. This wasn't the plan. 
And he grabbed me, and he grabbed that nacho cheese, and he said, I love the cheese, brother. <laughs> and a light bulb went off in my head, and I said, this guy's just talking to me. This is amazing. I mean, I don't have to talk to people before the show. Wow, this solves so many of my problems. That began the part of my career where I would actively hide from my opponents. Oh, we'll just call it out. You know? All of that independent wrestling and traversing the United States and going to Japan, going to Puerto Rico, going to Europe. Back when you had to smuggle merch into Europe and you were terrified because you were just a 19, 20 year old kid, you're reading the declaration thing and you're like, if you have more than $10,000, and you're like, oh shit. If I sell too many t-shirts, they're gonna get me on the way back. <laughs> Nobody's ever taught me about any of this stuff. God damn it. I, I landed a spot in Ring of Honor, and it's the first time I ever met Mickey James, who's the Rhea, Rhea Chris. She's like a rabbit's foot. She's, she's not, not a bad penny, but a good penny. She keeps coming back. I met Mickey James for the first time. Eddie Guerrero was still wrestling there. I learned from a guy named Raven. And I learned, I, listen, I know, I know a lot of people, they might not like Raven. Here's a little secret too. A lot of people might not like me. The Raven, coupled with the things that Eddie has taught me, and Tracy had taught me, and Ace taught me, and you mix it up with what Raven taught me. Like, eh, kid, listen, eh. It's not about the moves. The first time I ever wrestled Raven, if I may afford some of your time for this ridiculous story, he got a ridiculous amount of color on one of those Wednesday night TNA pay-per-views, right? And I'm wrestling for, for Norm Connors IWC. You were probably there too. I think you were 12. <laughs> He's got the, 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 the Crockett era Ric Flair just athletic tape on his head. And he's sitting there, and I've never met him before, and I walk up to him, and I'm like, hello, sir, hi, you know, my name's, my name's Punk, you know, whatever you want to do. And he's like, ah, just tell me a couple things you do, kid. Ah, uh, you know, maybe we'll do this. And as I'm talking to him, he, he just starts leaking. <laughs> he hasn't done anything, but he got such great color Wednesday night at the Nashville Fairgrounds. He's leaking. And I'm looking yeah. at him, and I'm like, you're bleeding. And he goes, ah, shit. There's a match about to go up. Some kid's about to debut. Raven grabs him and he goes, ah, sorry, kid, we gotta go. And he's just like, start fighting. And we start, we start brawling and we go through the curtain because he's already bleeding. He's like, we gotta go. So once again, thank you, Tracy Smothers. Thank you, Eddie Guerrero. Thank you, Ace Steele. You have given me the knowledge to not be afraid going out and doing something on the fly with this man that I had just met and never wrestled before. He's bleeding. I start chopping the shit out of him. And he's going, eh! Eh! And he starts giving me a shoulder. And I'm like, this motherfucker, you know? Stop giving me your shoulder. I'm trying to, I'm waffling this shit up. This is a lesson learned. We get the back and he goes, eh, kid, come here. Listen, chops are stupid. They hurt, and they suck, and don't ever chop me again. And I was like, <laughs> Duly noted, but we didn't talk about it, so, you know. I didn't know. Armed with the new knowledge that I got from Raven and so many others, I continue to wrestle. Tommy Dreamer calls me one day and he says, Tom, the WWE wants to take a look at you. And I said, shut the fuck up. No, they don't. This is 2004, maybe. He says, no, they really, really do. I was doing dark matches. Tom Pritchard was booking extra talent. He said that he legitimately want to take a look at me. And I thought, well, this is the chance. WWF to me was never the goal. I looked up to people who went to Japan to wrestle. I thought the idea of going to Japan and being a superstar, like a Bruiser Brody or a Stan Hansen or an Eddie Guerrero, and then coming home and nobody knowing who you are, man, I thought that was the coolest idea in the world. That's what I wanted. When I wrestled in Japan, Hashimoto told me, mm, baby, too big cruiserweight, too small heavyweight. My dreams dashed against the rocks. But Tommy called, and I said, Tommy, if they legitimately want to look at me, I, 
I said, I'm not, I'm not a WWE guy. You know, I'm a skinny fat, Hunter fans would call me that on TV. He wasn't wrong. I wore basketball shorts. I dedicated myself, I, I, I told Tommy, I, Tommy, I said, give me, give me six to eight months. I'm gonna bust my ass and I'm gonna get into shape. And I do everything I can to when they legitimately take a look at me, they will not be able to say no. And in the line of this, none of this being about me, I wanna thank Val Venus. I had a match with him on Sunday Night Key that, That got me my job. And I knew it got me my job. And people will tell me that I'm cocky, and I know sometimes I am, but I knew leaving that ring, I said, I almost had abs, JBL, believe it or not. You said something up here yesterday that really resonated with me. You gotta work out hard to look this bad. <laughs> Same is true for me. So I'm offered a job, and I'm blown away. In my 2001 Monte Carlo, which is the first thing I ever bought with my own money. I'm gonna jump back in time. I'm gonna jump back in time really, really quick here. The 2001 Monte Carlo, I don't know if anybody's ever heard this story about Harley Race in my 2001 Monte Carlo. The first time I ever met Harley Race, he was a special guest referee for a match I had in Wisconsin. And Harley comes up to me before the match and he goes, Hey, kid, don't do any of that one, two, one, two, one, two bullshit. <laughs> I don't get up and down as fast as I used to. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think Harley wanted to count like Bronco Lubitsch just yet. I think he had too much pride. And I was terrified of Harley Race. This is the toughest man in professional wrestling he's ever seen. Sorry, Haku. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I would get taken over and have my takeover, Harley would come over and he'd go, what do you say? And he would stick his index and his middle finger straight up both my nostrils. <laughs> and I was, and I was just a, a young 20-something punk kid looking at the lights going, why is Harley Race doing this to me? <laughs> and if you've ever met Harley, Harley had legit hands of steel, and his fingers were like sausages. So to actually jam his fingers in my nose, it hurt quite a lot. Not as tough as Harley Race. Harley Race liked me for some reason, and I didn't get it. Tracy Smothers liked me for some reason, and I didn't know why. I'd never fit in anywhere before. Eddie Guerrero loved me, and I never knew why. Later that night at the bar, Harley Race is accepting shots from every single fan. He's getting loaded, but if you know anything about Harley Race, you know this guy can get loaded. His loaded is a different planet than anybody else's loaded, right? But Harley was a little bit older. He wasn't the legendary Harley from the 70s. Sure, he could probably drink hard. I think he might have got to him a little bit. Ace comes up to me and he goes, hey, can you stick around? We'll just take Harley back to the hotel later. I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So it's later that night. Harley comes out of the bar. We're walking in the car. And I'm watching Harley. It sounds very disrespectful to say he was waddling. But it had a lot more to do with the state of inebriation than it did with his body type or anything else. Harley waddles out of the bar and he stops and he gives me, he gives me one of these. <laughs> this is my brand new 2001 Monte Carlo. It's the first thing I ever bought with my own money. He sits shotgun, he sits in the back seat. We're driving to the hotel and I'm looking at Harley and all of a sudden he goes, Hardest man in professional wrestling history. This man can hold his alcohol. <laughs> Rolls the window down, turns, and a noise I will never forget as long as I live. 
he says, <laughs> and spits a mouthful of vomit out the window. And I'm driving, I'm going at a good pace. It immediately blows back all over a steel. <laughs> and I look at the rookie mirror and I'm just like, holy shit. And I look at Harley and he does it again. And he slowly turned, like, I don't think Harley had a quick bone in his body, everything was slow. He just slowly turned to the window and he went, <laughs> like a balloon deflated. So I start to pull over. He does it again. But this time, since I'm pulling over, he turns to me. <laughs> swallows. And, and grabs my forearm and says, don't pull over. You'll alert the authorities. <laughs> this continues the entire way to this hotel room. We get to the hotel room. We walk him in. We, we, I'm thinking, man, I'm going to tuck this motherfucker into bed. You know what I mean? Like, but we get, to the, we get to the elevator and he turns to me, he's covered in puke, and he says, Well, my friend, I hope you have it in your heart to forgive me for throwing up in your car. <laughs> and I said, Yeah, man, you're highly race. <laughs> and then he proceeded to give me the big hug. The point of all that is, you know, I literally, it's in the name, I'm just a punk rock kid from Chicago. I didn't fit in anywhere. I wasn't supposed to fit in in any lot. Gosh, I remember the first time I was in WWE, and I felt like I fit in. The names on that roster that were regular house show loop guys, JBL, Batista, Shawn Michaels was still on the road. I know because I had to tag with him and take all the bumps. That was my job, and I did it gleefully. Ric Flair was still on the road. Triple H, The Undertaker, Edge, Jeff Hardy, Umaga. I'm forgetting people. That's the shitty thing about being up here and not writing anything down. Somebody's going to text me. I hope I forget somebody who's dead so they don't text me. <laughs> At this point in my life, I'd rather be haunted than text me. I know this is long, guys, but I'm having fun. I hope you are, too. I got a job with WWE, and, and it's because I wouldn't be denied. And then when I got there, I feel like I worked so hard that my heroes, the people I looked up to, became my peers and my rivals. Mickey? I'm driving my Monte Carlo, which is probably still stained with Harley's puke, from Philadelphia. I wrestled an hour in the Philadelphia Armory. Everything that I own is in my car. I drive it straight to Chicago. I got a job. I'm finishing up my day to bring a honor. And I'm, I'm just a kid. I'm high. I'm 25, 26. I'm high on life. It's amazing. The sun's coming up. I'm driving on, on, on I-90. I'm in Indiana. I see the sign that says, Welcome to Chicago, and my phone rings. And I look, and it's, I know it's a 203 number, so I know it's somebody from WWE. So I answer it, and it's Howard Finkel. And Coco, it warms my heart to know that I got the same phone call you did. Yours just was a couple decades earlier. Howard Finkel's on the phone, and he goes, Hello, see you. Oh, I can't do a Howard Finkel impression. I'm not going to do one. Uh, he tells me that I'm booked for Monday Night Raw. Now, I wrestled Saturday night, and I'm like, oh shit, it is like 9 in the morning, Sunday morning, what, what do I gotta do? He says, we're in Cleveland. And I was like, Howard, I just drove all night. Like, if you would've called me five hours ago, I would've been in Cleveland, I just would've pulled over. You know, and he says, don't worry about it, we'll fly in Monday morning. Great, so I get, I get home, I rest. Monday morning, my first day on the job, I show up to the rental car uh, 
desk in Cleveland, Ohio, and there's Vicki James. And I go, Vicki, what are you doing here? And she's like, they're calling me up, and I heard, is it me and you? Are we doing something? And I went, I don't know. So we rode together to the building, and we get there, and somebody comes up to us, and they says, you guys are on Sunday Night Key. Now, for the kids in the audience, that used to be a little show. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so me and Mickey get told that uh, we're, we're together, but we're running around. Do you remember Alex, SmackDown writer? Okay, Alex couldn't, yeah, Alex Greenfield, he couldn't tell me shit. He was like, you guys are together, and I went, me and Mickey got together, we're like, great, are we brother and sister? <laughs> are we married, are we together? Are we like Mickey and Mallory from Natural Born Killing? I just started like, you know, spitball. And as we're talking, Michael Hayes walks by and goes, CM Punk, I'm kidding. And I looked at Mickey and I was just like, oh man, pressure's on. I can't fumble this fucking ball because it's her career. Uh, Hunter comes up to the ball and says, you just thankfully reminded me. And he looks at Mickey and he goes, you, I get it. And then he looks at me and he goes, you, I get it. He goes, together? Because I don't fucking get it. And he walks away. So to set the table, um, debuting, Mickey's debuting. Uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to be a baby face. I have purple hair. Yeah. And we're in Cleveland, and they're going to announce me from Chicago. And I just, you know, I got like shitty tattoos, and I'm with the hot girl with the big boobs. And I just remember pulling Mickey aside and going, "This isn't going to work. <laughs> this is. They're going to. They're going to." Out of me, and you're gonna take the stray from this one. We came up with a elaborate entrance, and I think we even might have kissed, and that was the kiss of death. The instant I kissed you in front of Cleveland, they might have started throwing fucking garbage at me. I proceeded to have an eh, okay match, but it wasn't up to snuff, and I remember getting it back, and Arn and Hunter and Sean were just kind of standing in the corner. And it felt like high school because they're all just like kind of pointing. I knew they were talking about me, and I was just like, oh God, I guess I should have been. And then, and then I got sent to Ohio Valley Wrestling, and I figured six months tops. You never would have got to meet me, JBL. How sad. But the best thing about being in OVW is I got to work with Danny. And I don't know, it's a reoccurring theme in my career. I don't know why Danny liked me. All these old school guys, all these tough guys, I don't know why they put up with me, I don't know why they liked me. Paul Heyman would allow me to come to the Davis Arena on Tuesday night and help write the television show. Because my thing was, I'm never going to call up. I, I, that was my one chance. Back then, with all those names on the roster that I listed, it was it was just a shark tank. You weren't going to get a shot. And I figured that was my one shot. But as long as I was going to be in that house, I was going to learn as much as I could from Danny Davis and Paul Heyman. And Paul spent his time and taught me how to write a television show. He taught me how to time a television show. He taught me half a second out, half a second in for commercial. Danny Davis. Paul let me sit in the control room with them and learn how to edit a television show Wednesday night. This is when I started drinking coffee. I developed insomnia. That is not a joke. That is real life. I figured I had six months. I was going to learn as much as I possibly could. And when I was back on the Indies, I was going to apply that. Um, I slipped through the cracks. Paul Heyman got me in and got me on television. Somehow with CM Punk, I figured I was going to be an astronaut or a farmer or something, but to me that meant it's not that Vince didn't care, it's just that he didn't care enough about me or ECW that I was able to slip under the radar of CM Punk. I was CM Punk 15 years old wrestling in the backyard. I had no business being on WWE television with these giants.
Giants and these legends wrestling as CM Punk, but I did. And JBL, I don't know, they put the title on me. I won the money in the bank. I was in the right place at the right time. And, you know, this guy who, let's be honest, people would tell horror stories about, him, okay? He's the only, I, I, I remember having a match with Batista and you, and I'm, I'm the little guy, I'm taking bumps, but I'm supposed to be a baby face and I'm supposed to be the champion. But it was, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting shit kicked out of me, I'm getting powerbombed, you're Larry, I mean, you know, like, it was, it was the job, and I remember laying there, and they kind of threw the title on me, this is the main event. It just wasn't working, there's two household name superstars and the new guy who probably didn't deserve the gold at the time. And I was laying there thinking, well, this sucks for me, but like, I mean, I understand the position I'm in. So, you know, I don't know, back to the drawing board. And you marched back to the ring, unannounced, didn't tell anybody you're doing this, didn't tell me, you got in the ring, you picked me up, and I was like, oh, he's just gonna close my me again. <laughs> and you shot me off the ropes and you said, duck one GTS. And I was just like, first guy to do that for me. Thank you. Yeah. Like Eddie Guerrero, like Harley Race, like Tracy's mother, like all these other people that I had watched on television that I wanted to emulate. This is somebody who I thought never in a million years would like me. For some reason he did. I don't know. I don't know if I, at some, some point along the way I gained your respect. I gained Taker's respect. And that is the point of all this, because none of this is about me. This is about the people who came before me. And I miss a lot of them. I miss Eddie. I miss Chris Candido. I miss Tracy Smothers. I miss Harley Race. I miss Terry Funk. But it makes me appreciate the ones that we still have that I can still text every day. I can still text Jerry Briscoe. I can still text Bret Hart. And I can still see all of you. And if it wasn't for all of you, and I mean that, everybody, because that's the other big thing is I'm appreciative of every promoter who's ever paid me or not paid me because it's been, it's been a lesson, you know? None of us are anything if it wasn't for the fans. Now we can all be egomaniacs and talk shit about it. Oh, that's not on this, on that, on that. But the fact is that the seats are empty. There is no us. Now I know throughout my career, probably rubbed some people the wrong way. Some people like me, some don't. What I always had was the backing of legends. Teal, your father, who is my, my hero, Roddy Piper. Roddy Piper's the reason I'm a wrestler today. And I remember the last time I saw him, he told me he was proud of me. So when people tell me that they don't like me or the internet's mad at me, I just kind of chuckle because Roddy Piper liked me. Dusty Rhodes loved me. I had the respect and the backing of Harley Race before I went to the WWE. And to me, that means more than all the money in the world. But because these legends put their stamp on me before anybody even knew who I was, it gave me the confidence and it gave me the ability to succeed in a place where I don't think I ever fit in. And I, I've always struggled with a little bit of imposter syndrome. You know, it's a strange business. You're supposed to you're supposed to just talk shit. You're supposed to tell everybody that you're the best. Everybody compares numbers. I drew this number. I made this much money. I won this title. I did this. I did that. <sighs> it's completely lost my train of thought. It's like one day I just woke up and I was an old timer and I was at the cauliflower alley club. <laughs> Oh,
close to me now that's sharing a locker room and have those kids come up to me and they tell me, and I get emotional when they tell me, they tell me, man, I saw you sit cross-legged on a stage in Las Vegas and that brought me back to wrestling. Or I see a kid come up to me and they show me a tattoo and it says straight edge and they say, I've never done drugs, smoked, drank because of you. And to me, just like the stamp of legends, that means so much to me. And if there was a reason I'm still doing this, it's that. When people come up to you and they say, you saved my life. It's, it sounds a little far-fetched, but God damn it, I understand. And I take that responsibility to heart. And that means a lot to me because I was touched through pro wrestling by legends like Roddy Roddy Piper and Terry Funk and Harvey Race. To know that I've inspired even just one kid to do something positive or to get into this business and to respect this business, that means the world to me. So this award means the world to me. I'm sorry for wasting so much of your time. One more, one more highly race story because this one's good. I think you're really going to like this one. Is it okay if I tell this? You could have said no. You really do like me. God bless you. Thank you. Yeah. I may have been in Madison Square Garden against this guy. And I was terrified. I was like, ah, he's going to kill me. This guy hates me. He's going to make me drink a beer. I don't know what. And right before the match, he walks in the locker room and just looks at me dead in the eye, shakes my hand, and goes, Madison Square Garden lights on, probably 20,000 people. Nobody gets to do this. Congratulations. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. <laughs> and I was just like, oh man, I don't think I can tell anybody that story. He's really kind of a nice guy. It's going to ruin his whole gimmick. You know? I'm on a show. We're in Elvin. We're at Buzzer McGee's, which is the bar that was directly across from Harley Race's school. You know what I'm talking about. No? Okay. I might have, did you go to bed? No, you're still there. Okay, good. <laughs> so, Harley buys shots for everybody. Now, we just got done working the show, we're sitting there, and the waitress comes by, and she puts a shot in front of everybody, and then, here's me, she puts a shot in front of me, and everyone looks at me, and I go, <laughs> and she goes, Harley Race bought those shots, honey, you better drink it. And I said, I don't drink. And she said, Harley Race bought those shots, honey, you better drink it. I said, I'm true. And she said, Harley Race bought those shots, honey. You better, I thought she was going to beat me up. She like got in my face. And I was just like, I don't drink. I don't drink. So now everyone's giving me shit. You know, that's, it's eighth grade all over again. Just drink it. It's only one shot. Just drink it. And I'm like, I don't drink. I look over at Harley. Harley's looking at me. He's pulling the shot glass. And I'm just like, oh, I guess. It's been a good run. I'll never work in the business again. I, I, I don't drink. And everyone did the shot, and mine's still sitting there. I think Ace probably took the bullet for me and drank it. And I was just sitting there, and I, I felt, I don't know, I, I felt this, it just felt weird. So I was like, let's just make it weirder. And I get up, and I go to the bartender, and I go, do you guys have milk? <laughs> and she's like, hang on. She opens the fridge and she goes, who knew? We have milk. And I looked and I counted and I was like, I need 17 shots of milk. <laughs> now, I am not a suicidal person, but I was flirting. I was flirting with it right here. So we get 17 shots of milk and just like before a little deja vu, the same waitress plunks down a shot in front of everybody, but this time last is Harley plunks a shot of milk right in front of Harley Race, and I'm sitting behind him, and I'm looking at him, and he does this. <laughs> Is that milk? <laughs> and I'm holding a shot glass, and I went, yes, boss. And everyone waits, nobody's touching their shot glass, and Harley Race, picks up his shot glass, and he raises it to me, and then everyone else follows suit. 
downs the shot of metal, slams it in front of him, and he didn't beat me up. <laughs> and I figured at that point, if Harley Race accepted the punk rock kid from Chicago who wore basketball shorts and Doc Martens and had no business knowing or wrestling for Harley Race, that I was going to be okay. Everything else has been gravy since then. I have dreamed bigger and done things 15-year-old me never would have believed. And I've failed huge. But I think I've succeeded even bigger because I've learned from all those failures. And it has been my pleasure and my honor. And if I have made you happy in a wrestling ring, if I have made you mad in a wrestling ring, that's even better. Yeah. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.